Assalamu alaikum wa Just before we begin, if you support the Young Smirks podcast and you want to help support the channel, please go to the Patreon below and support us monthly so we can keep up with the shows. We've got lots of content coming up. We're going to have special content specifically for the Patreons as well as a new series on Hijra, inshallah. So please go to the Patreon below and support the podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs> أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome to the Young Smirks podcast It's me John Fontaine and I'm with a very special guest The number one cowboy online It is Brandon Estes السلام عليكم bro How's it going cowboy? السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته brother ما شاء الله I don't know about number one cowboy but Hey cowboy what's going on? <laughs> Maybe funniest looking cowboy. Alhamdulillah. How you doing, bro? Alhamdulillah. Now Man, we, we, well, we, we actually did a podcast a while back, but um, for technical reasons, it didn't work out for some reason. Um, I was having issues with the audio. So I was considering doing another podcast when we meet again. But I thought, you know what, alhamdulillah, you've got your new equipment, you've got your new studio, you're all set up, you've been doing some podcasts online. So I thought, why not just do it online? So alhamdulillah, how's everything going? Yeah, alhamdulillah, yeah, it looks good. Um, I think, you know, what the problem was, is I was wearing my thobe and I think the way things were supposed to be was I was supposed to be in my, my country attire, so... Yeah, you know, um, now, how about everything's good in Medina. Yeah, you know, clothing, it does affect um, the way you are, actually. The way people are. It's, a, it's an important part of personality, I believe. Um, part of me wearing a baseball cap, actually, is to make the guest feel a bit more relaxed, believe it or not. That's my kind of psychological thing behind it. Because if I, if I don't wear a cap, if you, if you notice some shakes that I interview, I don't actually wear the cap. Because I'm trying, uh, yeah, to, be, right, right. trying to be a bit more serious. And, and if you're wearing a thobe as well, sometimes you get a different reaction of the, uh, the guest as well as myself as well. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, when you put on a thobe and go to the masjid, you know, you have a different kind of feel, right? Than if you're just going in, uh, you know, normal kind of Western style clothes. I think you do anyway. So I completely agree. I, I see it. I can, I can feel it. Yeah. So, um, Brandon Estes, um, I know you've been asked this a million times. I already know. <laughs> I already know. No, 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 no. I'm not going to ask that question. I know the question you're thinking I'm going to ask. I'm not going to ask. So go on. He's my evil twin step neighbor. Oh, so you you tell me what's the question you think I was going to ask? He's he's my brother from another mother. You thought I was going to ask? Are you, are you related to Yusuf Festus? I, I yeah, because I was asked yesterday, the day before, and the day before. But I was going to ask a different question. Look at I, know, I, I, I know assuming. you're not related to you. You know, you know, you you know what they say in the South when you go on assuming, right, John? I don't know if you've heard of it, but when you assume, it makes a donkey out of you and me. And I'm not going to say the real word that you're supposed to say. In oh, that joke. So what I was going to ask is, do you know the origins of the name Estes? So allegedly the origin from the little bit of research that I've done in the research that uh, Sheikh Yusuf has done is that it comes from the root word ustev, um, which in and itself is not, it's, a, it's an Arabicized word, okay? It's not originally uh, Arabic, um, but it was used in Andalusia for many years. And then from after the Inquisition, uh, the people who were from the ustev tribe family uh, when they left to go to England and Britain, and then afterwards to the United States, it changed from Ustez to Ustez, and then in America to Estes, and then even after that to Estes. And now you're an Ustaz. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, so I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to cook some good barbecue. I'm a. I'm a shit. I'm. A, I'm a steak ustaz. Mashallah. So the first time I came across one of your videos, you was giving the adhan as a cowboy in in the states. I think you was actually with with them um, UC Festus at the time, and this video went viral. You know, seeing this white boy, white boy from down south, calling the adhan. You know, is it? It was a bit shocking. I remember that day too. I was mustered the uh, mustered the salam uh, in, in in Arlington, and we had a big program going. We were going to go uh, meet some people afterwards to talk about a studio project that we wanted to do in, in Dallas. And Yusuf, I had just gotten off work. I just got off work, and Yusuf was like, "You know what, Brandon? Why don't you make the event for a month of time, and let's just film it and let's put it on my YouTube channel?" I was like, "Okay, let's talk it out alone." Right, so I'm going to go make the event. And there wasn't really anybody there. It was pretty much empty. And so I didn't think anything of it. I was just like, oh, this is, you know, cool. You know, I'm going to make the event, get the attention and reward for that. And then in one week, Sheikh Youssef goes back to look at his video logs. And, you know, I'm looking at it as well. And, oh, 1.4 million views. Like, and, and so much so that my non-Muslim family somehow was shown it by somebody and my, my sister, my parents didn't say anything because I don't think they wanted to recognize it. But my sister was like, oh, my gosh, brother, you're famous. You know, so. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know, um, Alhamdulillah, you, um, you're currently studying in Medina. So I wanted to kind of get a bit of insight into your experience in Medina. But, but how did you accept Islam? How, how did you find Islam? And what's your Man. kind of background, where you're from? And, you know, I know you're a Christian, but what type of church were you in? So, man, uh, I was raised Methodist. And Methodist is a, a denomination from the Protestant and closer to Lutheran denominations. Because uh, from the Protestants, you have the main branch off that started from, uh, from what you call Catholic, Catholicism, uh, which they are the protesters came Protestant, and then the, like the actual name Protestant, the capital P, and then you had Lutheran and from the U, Methodist and so on and so forth. So I was raised Methodist, but as time went on, you know, we went through many churches. We tried out many different churches. Uh, my parents hated Baptists because you know, they didn't, I guess they weren't as fun, or at least they did do all the stuff, but if you're a Baptist, you're not supposed to drink, but all the Baptists we knew, they would still like sneak beers and stuff. And so uh, I forget, we used to have a name for them. Um, but I, I just, after, after high school, uh, I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to start seeking the truth because I had gotten in trouble with, you know, with a few things. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to put my nose to the grindstone, go to, because uh, I was going to Texas A&M University. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of look, see what the truth is, which version of Christianity is the, is the right one. So for me, that was my first seeking. After that, it was several years later uh, that I went through the Bible again after getting in more trouble with the law. And I decided that, you know, just come to myself, no Dawa, not meeting any Muslims, nothing. I decided, you know what? Jesus is not God. I, I just, when I was reading it, especially reading things like a, a Hosea 11, 9, and, you know, where it says, where well, I will not devastate um, and come against Ephraim again. Um, uh, and I, for I am God and not a man, because a lot of people want to quote Numbers twenty three nineteen, and that also did it for me as well. But people would say, "Oh, this means that God is not a man that he should lie." Well, Jesus didn't lie, so therefore he still can be the Son of Man and God. Okay, and not God, you know, and so on and so forth. They played the gymnastics with it. So when I saw Hosea eleven nine, it just says God is not a man. Period. So that was one of the main things that did it for me. And so for four years, I went on just being a monotheistic Christian all on my own, right? And so I was no longer using the rose-colored glasses of Trinitarianism to read into the Bible when I would read it. So whenever I would read things like the Father and I are one, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I was now, because I had come step back from an objective standpoint, I saw these things as metaphorical, like, oh, if you see Jesus, then you've seen the will of the Father. You see what I'm saying? So that's kind of how I was moving and progressing forward. 
And it wasn't until one day when I, uh, you know, was going through a lot, um, that, you know, I'm just, you know, I, I did, did this uh, story with uh, Eddie. May Allah, you know, be pleased with him and bless him. Um, but I was, you know, going through a really rough day one day and I opened up my Bible uh, and I immediately opened to the page where Jesus prostrated in the garden. And I remembered what my pastor Randy said. And he said a couple of weeks before, you know, we don't, and this, this is out of nowhere. He said, we don't put our heads on the ground like them Muslims. So we're, oh. we have honor. So don't humiliate yourself. It would be one thing if you said, don't humble yourself. He said, don't humiliate yourself and put your head on the ground like the Muslims. Get, we get on our knees and we ask for God like this. And I remembered that when I read this verse. And it never struck me before. I never really paid attention to it. But I read this verse and I was like, subhanAllah, Jesus did this. And I claim to follow Jesus. I don't worship him. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do what Jesus did and then disobey the preacher, right? I'm, I don't care what he says. And I put my head on the ground. Long story short, I asked for guidance. God guided me. I saw some things. You know, you can watch the other videos to get the whole story. Um, but I picked up a question. I said, if this is true, I said, if this is true, I'm going to go find out for myself. I'm not just going to take it because the dream I could tell that I felt like it was true, but at the end of the day, we don't base our salvation on dreams because a Christian, I knew, and I knew this at the same time. I knew Christians who had said, I didn't see Jesus. I see the Holy Spirit. And now, therefore, I'm reborn. And I, you know, even they get stronger in their, in their ship, in their, in their Trinitarianism. And yeah. so I said, okay, if this is true, the evidence is going to back it up. So I had a Quran on my shelf because I had a lot of books in, on my wall in, in my house. I took off the Quran. I was like, I'm going to start reading this. I'd read all these other books. Let's do the Quran. As soon as I opened to that first page, John, wallahi, I started crying tears like I never cried before. And I, I couldn't stop crying. And I kept going page after page. I'd open it up to another section. And I was just so flooded with these emotions of, oh, my God, I can't believe nobody has ever shown me this before. I'm so angry. How could the church have hidden this from us? How come, you know, they taught other, everything just made sense. I was yeah. like, this is so simple. Worship one God, believe in all the prophets. There's paradise, hellfire. You choose where you want to go. End of story. It was, it was so easy. And I was like, this is what I am. This is what I want to be. But I didn't know what to do next. I didn't know there was a such thing as a shahada or whatever. And um, that's, you know, that came a week later after asking a few people, uh, kind of digging on, watching some videos. And <laughs> I'm skiing myself, but may Allah bless them, though. The, the brothers who I talked to about this, they're like, yes, you have to give shahada in the masjid on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I even drove all the way to Houston that Wednesday to go meet them. May Allah bless them. Um, I'm sure they were overwhelmed because I was like saying a lot of things and, you know, I'm sure as a new Muslim, like everything, everything was, I probably sounded like maybe crazy to them too anyway, but they're like, yeah, yeah, just go give, go give Shahada on, uh, on, on Friday in the Masjid instead of right there. But Hamza, that's, it is what it is. And then what I did, uh, Sheikh Kinnad and Mekki was the one giving the, uh, the khutbah. Mm -hmm. And so when he had me say it, Wallahi, John, that feeling that I got the week before, because it was a Friday when I oh, had my, my you, dream when I was in were you, um, were you his first one-minute shahada then? I had one. Yeah, mashallah. I was, no, I was, yeah, I was less than a one-minute shahada. I stood up, like 30 seconds shahada, mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> so, you know, like you said, you was kind of monotheistic um, before you actually found Islam. You'd already come to this conclusion about believing in uh, one God and and that Jesus is not a part of God. You know, you you worship God alone, the Creator. Um, did you go to any Unitarian churches, or was you kind of still was you was you still going to the Trinitarian community, but you this was like a, a private belief? The Unitarian churches today they're called Unitarian Universalist churches, and they're not Unitarian in the sense of the heretical Unitarian sects that came in the beginning of Christianity. Um, so like if you go to any Unitarian church today, 
they practice what we would call um, not pantheism, but uh, it's like the Abrahamic faith idea. What's that called? Um, starts with P. I think, but they basically they believe that as long as you believe in God, as long as you do good, you go to paradise, right? And I was like, okay, I don't agree with that. I believe that there is one path, there's one way, there's one truth. And so I would just still go to church though, one, because it was easy. And two, even though I was a Unitarian, like I committed, you know, I worked on the weekdays, I would go and party on the weekend. And then Sunday came around, I'd feel really guilty about my sins. So I had to go somewhere. So I, the only thing I knew that was in my area was the church. And so I just, I watched the passion of the Christ, which was done by Mel Gibson. That whole movie was done in Aramaic. He even went to Syria and learned Aramaic, and he got Aramaic-speaking people so that he could get all of the lyrics, all of the words for that entire movie done in Aramaic properly. And if you look in that movie, Jesus calls upon Allah by two different names, by Ilah and wait, wait, wait. Allah. The, the part, right? that, Which, that movie is, that you're saying, is that movie done in Aramaic? I didn't know that. I've not seen it. Yes. Yes. It's, yes. it's not done in English. No. It's subtitled. The whole movie is subtitled. Subhanallah. They're so, really trying to bring so, some type of authenticity to the to the story, right? Wow. Mel Gibson, he's hardcore Christian, mashallah. Uh, well, not mashallah, but he, he's hardcore Christian. Um, and so whenever I would go to church, whenever they would say, you know, put their hands up and they say, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Or amen. Yeah, we don't, they don't say amen. They say amen. I would, under my breath, I would say, in Allah's name, amen. <laughs> I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call upon Jesus anymore. As a Christian, like I would still go to church, but I was like, if I call upon Jesus, this is like the major, the biggest of sins. Like subhanAllah. Like oh. this is, is Ajeeb. Now that I think back upon it, like I'm just getting some of these memories now, mashallah. So um, because, and the reason why I said it under my breath was because in Christianity, if you go to the pastor, you say, hey, look, I want to become an atheist. He will invite you over for dinner and he'll say, hey, come on, let's talk about it. And, you know, tell me all about it. And they'll try to help you out. They'll, they'll, they'll do the best that they can. However, if you go to the pastor and you say, look, I'm still a Christian. I love Jesus, but I don't believe in the Trinity. They don't speak to you. You're out the door. Wow. Like you have you you have nothing to do with us. This is the greatest sin that you could do. It's worse than being an atheist, uh, at least the way they treat it. And so um, I kept it to myself. I was like, you know, no one's going to accept it as as it is. And I I recognized it. And so I kept it to myself. I was a closet Unitarian for four years until Allah guided me that day, January seventeenth, two thousand and fourteen. SubhanAllah, that's amazing. You know, it's, uh, but so one thing I, I always ask um, converts who were Christian before. So you did actually believe in the Trinity previously. You, you had that belief. So the only thing that I can think of where I might have confirmed it was in confirmation. So we had. Methodist and, and Catholics are the only two sects, I believe, that do this thing called confirmation, where when you're 12 years old, you get a spiritual advisor, which as yeah. Muslims, this is something we should we should do. We need to have mentorship programs and stuff for the youth, but not necessarily confirmation, but, you know, something, you know, like this, at least good, good ideas for youth programs. But you have to get a spiritual advisor. You go six months where you do all kinds of programs, talk to your spiritual advisor, and you basically confirm yourself in your belief. However, they never really pushed the Trinity that much. However, when it came time for the, the day of confirmation of the ceremony and all that, you do have to repeat the, uh, because Methodists take a lot from the Catholic, from the catechism and what you say, Jesus, um, who died on the third day, went to hell for three, you know, who, who died, went to hell for three days, resurrected on the third day, did all this stuff. You have to like have this whole thing who was, you know, a part of it, basically one part of the Nicene Creed, right? So you do have to at least know that. But as far as being a staunch Trinitarian, defending the Trinity, explaining the Father is God, 
the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they're not all the same, but they're all God. I never once repeated that statement in my life. I never went through these kind of um, gymnastics. It was just, I believe in God, I pray to God, and whenever I'm eating, or whenever my parents are eating, whatever the preacher would say, you know, a prayer, we would say, in Jesus' name, we pray, amen, right? Stuff for love. Yeah. And so that's the extent of it for me. My grandmother, don't know if my mom's going to watch this. You can always edit this out. We'll think about this. My grandmother, the day that I went to go visit her, uh, before she passed away, it wasn't right before she passed away, but a little bit before she passed away. Uh, the day that I went to go visit her, um, the final time that I saw her, I even asked her. I told her a little bit about my life. And I said, Mamo, said, you know, you were born, I think it was maybe Pentecostal or Baptist, but she converted to Methodist because they wouldn't marry her in the town that she was in to my grandfather unless they were of the same denomination. See, well, like that was like back in the day where you have to be the same denomination to even get married. It's kind of like a, a, a Shafi has to marry a Shafi and a Hanafi it used to has to marry a well. Hanafi. <laughs> it used to happen. No, it used to happen. Right. Um, this was what stop for the law. This is what happened in Andalusia. And some of the scholars were, you know, whenever they were having a lot of the issues, the scholars would complain about, look, you guys are arguing about this is a side tangent. You guys are arguing about marrying Shafis and this meth have and that meth have while we have invaders coming in and people, you know, destroying our country and we're we're going to be, you know, people are committing zina and all this stuff. And you want to talk about you know, these little matters, but that's neither here nor there. So my grandmother, <laughs> that was a tangent. My grandmother, I asked her in the hospital, okay, she was completely aware of this day, very cognizant. She was like more there than I have ever seen her. And I asked her a question. I said, grandma, I said, was Jesus God? Or was he sent by God? She said, Brandon, we always taught y'all that Jesus was sent by God. Jesus isn't God. And I was like, that's it. This is what I feel because because I was I, that day because I would already been Muslim for a while, uh, like maybe two, two years, I think. And I was like, this is, you know, this is what I always remember my parents teaching us. My parents never once focused on the Trinity. It wasn't until after I became Muslim that they became really, you know, Trinitarians because of the influences of their friends who are quote unquote trying to save them from my my shaitanism and or Satanism or whatever they call it. And so I asked my grandma, I said, can I read some Quran to you? And she said, yeah. I said, okay. I read her some Quran and, and then translated in English and then read mostly the English translation. And, and then I told her about the Prophet Muhammad. Then I said, Grandma, do you believe that this word that I just read to you and that the Prophet Muhammad is truly a prophet, just like Jesus, Moses, Abraham? She said, absolutely. Subhan. I said, Grandma, do you, want, do you want to? She's 92 years old at this point, 93. Uh, I said, Grandma, do you want to take that first step towards guaranteeing yourself paradise and joining this brotherhood and sisterhood? of the prophets and of their companions by saying the testimony of faith with me, confirming that you believe that Muhammad's a prophet, you believe uh, that Jesus is a prophet, and that you deny that Jesus is God, right? That's the main thing. And she yeah, said, yeah. yeah, I'll do it. And she said it, the Shahada in English and in Arabic with my, my wife, my brother-in-law, and my daughter, Celsa Bill, present. And I never saw her again until she passed away. And I was sad at myself because i you know i wanted to teach her how to pray even though she was you know in her 90s and i, I mean I, she had deteriorated also after that um by the way like i said you could edit this out because my parents still don't know <laughs> but if you want if you want to leave it and maybe they'll never uh, watch I'd this love to leave it in um, with your permission yeah um yeah yeah but uh, inshallah they probably won't they don't watch my stuff they can't stand watching like uh yeah, like yeah. a lot of my stuff like if i say my mom something she won't she won't watch it so you, you never but, um, that publicly before, right? Never. No, only a few people in my family know. So, and get this, I was I was crying so much when she died um, at a regret for myself because I was like, oh my God, is Allah going to take me to account for not teaching her how to pray? Like I didn't go. Like I was like, am I going to be at fault? You know, um, subhanAllah, brother, two weeks after she died, 
I had a dream and I'm going into the masjid and it's time for prayer, the call in the Iqamah. And um, I'm walking to the line to go stand in the line and I, out of the corner of my eye, I see somebody in, in the back of the room, white hair, like sitting down in a chair. And I decide, okay, I'm, I'll get back in line in a second. I'm going to go see who this person is. And I walk up and, you know, within 20 feet or so, I recognize who it was. And I get right up to her. I go up to her, take hold of her. And I'm like, ma'am, what are you doing here in the masjid? And Wallahi, she said, Brandon, you never taught me how to pray. And so I taught her how to pray in the dream. And she prayed with us in the masjid. So... This for me was glad tidings that inshallah Allah accepted her shahad inshallah because I was, you know, you know, uh, after that had happened, you know, my parents had visited her quite a few times. And I don't know because we were supposed to keep it a secret. She wasn't supposed to tell because I knew that they would try to convince her uh, to to leave it. And so, um, you know, for me, when I when I saw this dream, my heart was at rest. And so now, mashallah, I make dua for her and do things on her behalf. Alhamdulillah, I say rahimahullah. So I have a Allah, grandmother who Allah. is Allah. <laughs> it's amazing. secretly a Muslim, alhamdulillah. You know, it's a, it's a big relief for converts, you know, having a, a family member, a blood family member, you know, convert to Islam. It's everyone's dream. Um, I don't know anyone in my extended family that has accepted Islam yet. Um, but, you know, it's a dream, right? It's, uh, yeah. you know, having having someone from your own you know, lineage, find the truth as well and, and be able to understand what you found in the religion and, and, and actually understand that you're not some crazy brainwashed guy who's following some, some uh, you know, uh, foreign religion. You know, just having that kind of family member who's, who's also recognized the truth. It's everyone's dream, but that's, that's amazing, subhanAllah. And to, to have the dream as well, really really just uh adds to it um and uh, you know you have to thank allah for, for them dreams and and it reminds me of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh what it could be now for um Sorry. you know he was uh you know he was from the the followers of isa alayhi salam and he used to write the injil in his lifetime and you know the story when the prophet Peace be upon him. After he received the revelation from Jibreel, uh, Khadija took the Prophet son to Waraka, and Waraka recognized, okay, this is this is a prophet. He he recognized that this is the same angel that brought the the revelation to Moses and Jesus, and but then but then he passed away, and so there was this question on, you know, would he was he accepted or not? You know, was he a Muslim or not? You know, and and the Prophet ﷺ had a dream about him. And he had a dream, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was two dreams, actually, about two separate people who passed away before uh, the the Prophet ﷺ was technically, you know, a a Rasul. And, and, uh, and subhanAllah, uh, one of the dreams about one of the previous people was that he was wearing white, and the Prophet took this as, as to mean that Walaka was was one of the people who was saved, you know, technically a Muslim because he was following Isa alayhi salam. And even some scholars believe he he was he's the first convert, uh, arguably, to Islam because he recognized um he Allah, recognized Muhammad. He recognized him as a prophet and 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 he didn't deny him as a prophet. Um, some scholars say no, he 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 he'd not because uh, he said if if I live to the time when when your people reject you, uh, I'll follow you. So some scholars say that he didn't reach that time. But either way, he was he was uh, affirmed to be one of the people who who are uh, you know saved uh, the, the people from before the people who came Absolutely. between the prophets. But the, you know the, this this concept of having dreams. Uh, it is something that Allah does. This is, uh, you know, he sends people dreams to to give you that uh, confidence and, and remembrance to actually, like you said, now I make the offer. Now, you know, you were sure it, it gives you that reassurance that that, that, it, that it, it, it was real. 
And I recently had yep. some dreams about Alexa. Uh, I'm not somebody who dreams a lot, but I had some dreams about uh, Alexa, and then it really affected me because, uh, you know, it's it's it's, a, it's the most beloved place to me uh, on the, on the earth. How long? And um, we'll allow you to go many more times. And I mean, I'll pray. I think I can go with you. There's a. I mean, I, I mean. I, that's interesting. You mentioned that. There's, I think, two other brothers that right now they're having dreams about Alexa. And there, they, one of them even said that some of the, the big sheikhs, like one of the Shampitis and somebody else, also have been dreaming about good things happening with Al-Aqsa. So, yeah. inshallah, this is a glad tidings, inshallah. Bro, I mean, I, I know you personally, and, and, and obviously I know you on a personal level, and I know you've been through a lot of tests in life. And I was wondering if you wanted to share uh, some of that with us today, because... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an important topic, and I, I feel that even in the Muslim community, people are affected by uh, similar things. And I think by sharing some of these experiences, people might be able to benefit, especially e even if it's just seeing someone like yourself who, who has lots of confidence, doing well in life. You've got a beautiful, amazing family, mashallah, al mubarak. You know, you're studying Islam, you converted to Islam. You know, it, it just people knowing that people have also been through such tests. So the, the probably one of the biggest tests that I've been through in my life, and it took me a while. I think it took me, I was 12 when it happened, uh, eight, nine, eight or nine years for me to no, excuse me. I told them in 2010, and this was happened in 1998. It took me 12 years to tell anybody about it. 12 years that I kept it a secret. 12 years that it made me have a a. 12 years that it had an effect on my relationship with male figures, uh, with with male friends, with male fatherly figures like other uncles and stuff. Anybody who was a male, it, it affected the way that I viewed them, trusted them, and these kind of things. And ba basically, um, my my uncle had a, a roommate who was a Catholic youth minister. And this guy did one of the things that is, you know, you say it's unforgivable. Obviously, a law can forgive anything. But I was molested as a, as a fourth grader, as a young child, um, on multiple occasions. And... What, what's interesting about it, and I think the, the psychological aspect is what I want to get into, and I'm sure because it's, it's something that a lot of people deal with. He told me that this is what Jesus did with his disciples. He told me that this is what you're going to do when you get older with your own children, with you know, other children that you choose. He said, this is a, a part of life. This is a right. And he said, but we got to keep it a secret. You know, it's an, you know, you do it and then you keep it a secret and then the people, you know, it keeps going. Basically, like this is a chain of transmission, if you will, from Jesus all the way till now. And whenever this was happening, something didn't feel right about it. I mean, to the point where even as a fourth grader, I just had to start, like, I started acting weird around him. I started, like, not wanting to, and I just was like, this, this is, this is wrong, you know, because he would do it you know, when I was asleep and um, I would, he would do this when I was asleep and I would wake up to him doing stuff to me. And he was, he was actually a very big and strong, like he was a very buff uh, type of guy, which is straight. Like you see him at the gym, you'd never expect him to be a, you know, a pedophile. And so he, you know, I, I would wake up and I'm like, okay, I can't do anything. I can't stop him. You know, I don't know what to do. And he, uh, you know, it was very, it's really weird, you know, it's, it's disgusting, it's gross, but alhamdulillah, you know, when I got older, when I got into college, you know, I went through um, the, the test of telling my parents, and, and I told my uncle, and I, they're like, oh my God, we knew something happened, we knew it, blah, 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 you should have told us earlier, you know, we would have done this and this and this to him, and, and um, you know, he most likely he's done it to a lot of other children. And, and that's the thing is that, you know, this people who do this, they don't usually just stop with one. 
And so uh, it's, this was something that, you know, it took me a lot of years to find healing for, but I found healing um, through a loss of Panawatata, through God and, and trusting in him um, and for Islam. Once I became a Unitarian Christian, as we were mentioning earlier, that was really whenever I started finding the healing I needed. Um, and, and to just put this out there in case, you know, my parents do watch this or anyone else sees this, um, I never converted said so people accuse me of oh you converted because you were so traumatized from your molestation me converting to islam has nothing to do with it if if i was a muslim and i was molested by a muslim i would choose islam because islam is the truth yeah. not because of the adherence to it i didn't choose christianity um, after he did it and continue as a christian because i didn't have anywhere else to go and so whenever I found the truth, I left, not because of him, you yeah. know, but because of other things. And I invite him. I invite him. Look, if you want forgiveness, I'll forgive you. I'll just say his first name. I'll forgive you, Mike. But you have to be a Muslim. You have, you have to atone for all of your sins. There is no way that you're going to get forgiveness. And you think the punishment of you being a pedophile is going to be bad? The punishment of committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshiping Jesus and elevating him to a status that is not deserving of him and to degrading a lost status by calling him a man and what you have, you have called him. That's way worse. So I invite you to Islam, come home yeah. to the true religion and then you will find forgiveness from me. And inshallah, you will find forgiveness from your Lord. Jazakallah khair. You know, it's very brave of you to, to speak about this, this uh, experience and, and what you went through. Um, I had a similar um, thing happen within my own family. Um, it didn't right. personally happen to me, but it, it could have, and it nearly did. If, if you, it, it may have happened if, if um, uh, my cousin didn't speak out. But subhanAllah, I must have been about nine or ten years old at the time. And um, my grandmother was going on holiday. And so my mother said, okay, uh, she said to her father, you can come and stay at our house. You can, you can come, you know, while uh, the grandmother's on holiday, the grandfather come and stay with us. And it's me and my sister, we're young children. And my cousin, who was much older, she was around 30, 35 at the time, 35 years old. She said, no, no, it's okay. You know, I will go and uh, give him food and look after him while, while the, you know, the grandmother's away. And my mom said, no, it's okay. He's my father. He can come and, uh, you know, live with us. And subhanAllah, my cousin said, no, you know, he can't uh, go and stay with you. So my mom said, why? You know, what, what's, the, what's the big deal? And, and it came out that it happened that my grandfather had actually uh, been molesting my, my cousin um, when she was younger, um, from, from, from a very young age from as, as old as she can remember until she was around 16 years old. And um, if it wasn't for my cousin being brave and speaking out, who knows? Uh, maybe me and my sister may have been, uh, you know, uh, molested. Um, I mean, I, I, we were always educated from a very young age by my parents to, to speak out if anything like this was to happen. But... The, the fact is, you never know if with children, they get so scared and they, they get brainwashed by the or manipulated by these people that you yeah. never know. Would I, would it, would it, could it have happened in the first place? Would it have happened? But even if it would have, how would, it, how would you, us as young children have reacted? And, and subhanAllah, it's, it's really sad because half of, we have a very big family. Um, on my father's side, he's one of eight. So just on my father's side, there's maybe 60, 70 family members, uh, you know. And on my mother's side, she's one of six, you know. So that's another big side of the family. Oh, and half of, my, half of my mother's side of the family kind of supported the grandfather, even though he admitted it and said, oh, you know, it happened a long time ago. Let's just forget it and carry on. And my Let mother, bygones be bygones. Oh, yeah, and my mother said no. You know, at the end of the day, she she wanted justice, not just for uh, you know for him, 
to have his justice in this life, but also for for the for for, for her niece, who's my cousin, you know, and and my mother and and my niece and 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 the the, the auntie, uh, you know, they they took him to court, and he and he ended up being the most oldest prisoner in the UK. He went to prison. I'm not sure if he was released before he passed away, but he was in his 90s and he went to prison. Um, but the, the reality is that it broke down the whole family. It was devastating. I mean, um, and, and then now my mother actually looks back on uh, her own life because my mother wasn't molested. But what happened is, my mother was uh, actually raised with her older sister, who was married to an American diplomat. And, and it's interesting because when my mother got to a certain age, her, her eldest sister took her from her mother and father and said, I'll raise her. But she raised her in, in a very harsh way. But at the same time, my mother's now thinking back, thinking, was she protecting me from my father? You know, why did my older sister take me from my mother and my father? And, and why was I raising my older sister? And then now we're looking back thinking, you know, maybe she was also molested, possibly. You know, we, ne we never know. And it's interesting because it's, so, it's just been really terrible for the family. I mean, it's broke down the family. You know, this is like, this happened 25 years ago, maybe, maybe more when we found out about this. The, the whole family's broke down, that side of the family. Um, uh, my, my, we found out only a month ago that my mother's brother committed suicide because of this. He, he committed suicide. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important we spoke about this uh, topic. Yeah, absolutely. Number one, we should, uh, we, we should uh, of, of course, we, we, we let people know that this is wrong and this it should not be happening nobody has the right to touch you uh in, in a personal way at all and, and and if there's any young ones who who are listening you should you should uh you know speak to your your family members the ones you can trust the ones who uh, and you know who can get you help and, and protect you from from these things and 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 if it has happened to you in the past uh, it's not always the case that you might you might not speak out, but but sometimes there's a wisdom in speaking out in order to protect other people uh, from these evil people, and also um, you, you know to 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 make sure these people are brought to justice and and they don't the main thing is that they don't hurt anybody else. Um, but yeah, it's 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 terrible. But I, I think it was just an important thing for us to mention. Um, because it is very common. It happens in all over the world, different cultures, different religions, uh, you know, people of different faiths. It's affecting people, you know, and, 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 and uh, it's not right. And, and we hope that people get the help and the support and the protection they need from these things. Yeah. And another thing, too, you know, even though um, so someone might hear your story and say, well, look, we don't want to ruin a family. So it's better that we keep things under wraps. But at the end of the day, you can't control how people are going to react. Okay, that's first. And second, if you do not do something, so say if you know something happened to one of your family members, to a kid, okay, because we'll take, for example, maybe an incident that happened in Dallas, maybe several years ago, and, you know, where a child is molested by someone in the community, and then they keep it under wraps because they don't want a big fitting it to go out. We don't want people to know that Muslims have this stuff happen too. I, I get that. Uh, when you do a sin, you, you conceal your sins. However, when it you don't have to blast it out. However, when it comes to this issue and you live in the West or you live in the Muslim world, you need to tell the authorities. If you're a child and something, you need to take this because if you don't and you know your child or one of your, you know, your nephews or someone like that did have this happen to them and you do nothing about it, they're going not only to resent you, but you're going to be accountable to a loss upon us on the day of judgment for not helping to get justice for that kid. They'll get justice eventually on the day of judgment, but you will be held to account by a loss upon a 
yeah. uh, for for what happened, right? And at the end of the day, this goes on, this falls under ta'ziyah, which is like the judge has his own choice on the ruling. So if you're in the Muslim world, the judge decides what happens to the perpetrator and what compensation to give to the um, to the victim. But if you're in the non-Muslim world, you, by all means, there's nothing wrong with going to the police and telling them that this is what happened, you know, that because you know, the justice has to be served. And if that child goes through life without having something with it swept under the rug, you're going to have issues with apostasy. And this is one reason that I've met people who are apostates, who have left Islam. They use this as one of their main reasons. Not that they wanted to go to Christianity because they like Christianity better, but they couldn't any longer trust their family and their community. You know, and this is not what Islam is about. Islam is about uh, about trust. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that a mu'min is someone who other people's money, their blood, and their honor is protected. Honor is one of the the uh, uh, the six principles of the Sharia that the Sharia has come to protect. The Sharia doesn't ju- it protects life. It protects five other things, and then honor. So this is something that we have to remember. Bro, just before we 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 we, we wrap up, um, I just wanted to speak a little about bit about your time in Medina. Uh, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed you and your family to actually uh, go and live in Medina. You're living in Saudi Arabia. You're also always traveling, alhamdulillah, yeah. to Mecca and different places around Saudi as well. So I just wanted to, a little bit about your experience um, living in a Muslim country. And, you know, in the West, people hear about Saudi Arabia and they think everyone's getting the hands chopped off and, and uh, you know, Sharia law. And, and, you know, they have all these misconceptions. What's it like as an American uh, living in, in a Muslim country, living uh, in, in Saudi Arabia? First off, mashallah. It's it's great. I get to drink date water, and I'm big man. This is actually a sunnah, a sunnah, by the way. If you want to see, guys, this is unfermented. It's dates just sitting in water. The process I'm used to just let them sit for like a day or so overnight, and it's it's like really the water just sucks out all of that uh, sweet juice, and it's not too sweet either. Um, and you can always go ahead and eat the dates later. But mashallah, Saudi is great, man. The crime rate is mashallah extremely low. One of the lowest places here, Qatar and Dubai, have extremely low crime rates. I think it's some of the lowest in the entire world. The murders, the stealing, yeah, theft does still happen. But you don't have to go around like worrying. There's no like fear, like you have in the United States. People want to, you know, complain about Muslims being backwards, but you know, we still alhamdulillah these these Muslim countries have. A lot of good things going in them, and and Medina for sure. This is there's a tranquility here like I've never experienced anywhere else. I love Medina. Like I've been here three years now, so I, 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 can, I think I can safely call myself I have a Medina. Um, <laughs> so I will accept that. I, I I love Medina, man. And whenever I go outside of Medina, even though I love the Kaaba and going and visiting Mecca, I yeah. can't be there for very long. Like my heart is uh, not at it's not at peace there. Like I have this feeling, like I just I got to get out. I got to go back to to Medina, and you know this is from the du'a of the Prophet. He made multiple du'a that you know that it's as beloved or more beloved than Mecca, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala answered his du'a. So it's it's great studying here. Is it's been wonderful. I I mean I really I've benefited a lot from my time. And so I'll pray that Allah allows me to you know benefit even more. But this is, you know, it's great. And, you know, anyone who has the opportunity to, I do suggest, you know, try to at least go for maybe a couple of years. It's not something that's permanent the way that everything's set up. You can't. It's it's hard to do a permanent type of move. However, try to do it. But know, though, that you're going to be tested because Medina, it being here, moving here, it's something that a lot chooses those who are here. And so you're going to go through trials. It's, I'm not, you know, I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy. Um, you know, you're going to experience tests like you're like, man, why do things have to be this way? This is this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala test, testing you. So you got to be patient with it. Um, but at the end of the day, the Prophet said, whoever is patient, okay, this is one of the hadith about Medina, whoever is patient with it and the hardships that are with it, then I will testify for him on the day of judgment. Also, so this is a so we have the Prophet interceding. 
the general intercession. Well, he's there's several other hadith of specific intercessions where he intercedes even more. So this is a means of raising rank of your know, sins being forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, I love it. And they're doing a good job of keeping up a lot of things. You know, they're I think rebuilding Masjid Quba uh, right now. And you know, ma mashallah, things are you know really, you know, really nice and it's it's really easy. So any tourist want to come, even non-Muslims, if y'all are watching this, y'all can come visit. And you know, come check it out, and we'd love to talk to you about it. Fun. Jazakallah khair, bro. Um, you know, what, uh, inshallah, hopefully we can be doing more lives as well. Um, I, I used to do like a, a, a weekly podcast with a couple of other brothers as well, so maybe we can start that up more of a live um, podcast where we can have a bit more interaction. And I know you're doing a bit more on your channel as well. So, inshallah, we'll, we'll see more of you uh, online. Inshallah, bro. And uh, yeah, Jazakallah khair, bro. I think we've got some nice uh, little points of conversation. And it's a pleasure to have you on. All right, you as well.